Welcome, and thank you for finding your way here to our online worship service at Fairbanks First United Methodist Church. I'm Caroline. I'm the praise band leader here, and we just want you to know that we're happy you could join us today for the service. You're going to hear um, some scripture and prayers and praise music and traditional music, and it's all sung and spoken to God's glory. Thanks for being here and enjoy the service.
Welcome to First United Methodist Church in Fairbanks, Alaska. It is Sunday, August 25th, 2024. Today we're going to take a look at Jesus again, talking about bread, but this time also talking about the Word. Now, It's interesting, you know, prior to the printing press, people had a good reason for not having access to the Bible. Now it it might be something else. But also, later this week, on Friday, August 30th at 7 p.m., we're going to have concert pianist Thomas Pandolfi with us. And it's going to be an exciting time uh, as we have been gifted a wonderful gift of a grand piano, and um, we're going to hear him play it for us. See you then. Let us join together in the opening prayer. God, we give thanks that you have revealed yourself in the words of Scripture that are read and proclaimed among us. We're grateful that you also make yourself known in bread and the fruit of the vine. We thank you for all the people who support and challenge us to be better disciples. Our greatest joy is to experience your presence and to respond to you. And we do this humbly today. Amen. Now listen for a word from the Lord as I read from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 56 through 69. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in a synagogue in Capernaum. Many of the disciples heard it. They said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Then... What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who the ones who did not believe and who the one who would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Continent Travels in a Small Town talks about visiting Hannibal, Missouri, Mark Twain's hometown. The house there where the great writer grew up is still there, modest clapboard house tucked into the middle of what's now is Hannibal's downtown. Next to it is the famous whitewashed picket fence from the novel Tom Sawyer. Well, he meets up with another tourist who's made numerous visits over the years to the site and asks him, if he thinks the house is the same as described in Twain's books, and the man answers, well, I've, I've never read any of his books. Huh. How does this happen that you suppose someone who comes and visits a famous writer's home but has never read any of his books? Well, maybe he's got the knowledge secondhand or maybe only watched the movies. Yes, it could be stranger still also that there are legions of Christians, even passionate, enthusiastic Christians who talk about the Bible, maybe wave the Bible around and, and point it to pe at people and, and pound on it, yet have never opened its pages to actually read it. Once upon a time, there was a good excuse for not reading the Bible. It was back before Gutenberg invented the printing press and was able to mass produce not only Bibles, but other books as well. Before that, Bibles were extremely rare. All books had to be laboriously copied by hand, and what people knew many times of Bible stories um, was not so much what they'd read, but maybe based on stained glass windows at church. That's hardly as true today. Stop by any bookstore or do an Amazon search or simply go to Bible Gateway. And there's dozens, dozens of Bibles to choose from, different translations, all manner of special editions, where the Bible is probably more accessible today to a greater number of people on this planet than it's ever been in human history. Yet, why? We still live in a culture where there's many people who still haven't actually read it. Yes. Now, there's many times that we actually may not know what's in the Bible. It's, we might know of sayings that sound biblical, but are not actually there. How about the quotation, God helps those who, helps them, who help themselves? Does that come from the Bible or some other source? Now, if you said the Bible, you're wrong. God helps those who help themselves occurs nowhere in the Bible. Actually, it was written by Benjamin Franklin and published in Poor Richard's Almanac. And Of course, the idea that Adam ate some kind of an apple is not in the Bible. He ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. It doesn't specifically tell us an apple. How about money is the root of all evil? 
Actually, 1 Timothy 6.10 actually says that the love of money is the root of all evil, or all kinds of evil. How about the expression, God works in mysterious ways? Well, not in the Bible. Neither cleanliness is next to godliness, not in the Bible. Love the sin or hate the sin. Everyone likes to say that one, right? Huh? In the Bible? No, actually, it sounds biblical, but the words are attributed to Mahatma Gandhi, who said, hate the sin, not the sinner. How about love is blind? Well, in 1 Corinthians, it tells us that love is patient, love is kind, but love is blind actually comes from Shakespeare. In fact, it comes from the Merchant of Venice. Neither borrower nor lender be. If it's not in the Bible, oftentimes it's actually Shakespeare again from Hamlet. There's an example once of a court case. A court case which was actually overturned after jurors had brought Bibles into the courtroom because they wanted to discuss the phrase, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Of course, those that favored the death penalty were outraged and said, what kind of America is this where we can't bring the Bible into the courtroom or the, or the Bible is banned from the jury room? The only problem is the eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth when Jesus talks about it on the Sermon in the Mount. He says, you've heard that the eye, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but it, he doesn't stop there. In the very next sentence, he goes on to turn that around and actually call people instead to turn the other cheek. Looks like completely misrepresented what Jesus was saying. Do not seek revenge. Instead, go with my teachings of compassion and mercy. And sometimes we can, we can take Scripture verses out of context and may seem like uh, that uh, Jesus was, was advocating, say, for a death penalty. But if you read on a little further, quite the opposite is true. Biblical illiteracy is everywhere. In today's scripture reading, Jesus said, It is the spirit that gives life, the flesh is useless. These words have, I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Jesus is introducing a way to encounter Scripture that's different from the fundamentalism that we find around us today. Rather than focusing on static, unchanging, uninterpreted words on a page, Jesus describes that his words are alive, inspired by the Spirit. Notice how he says, the words that I have spoken to you, Jesus isn't talking about the words written, but he's talking about his own spoken word, that word that is to be his church, that his church is to receive. And it's by the grace of God, as we faithfully and prayerfully read the scriptures, pondering what the Lord might be saying to us through them. Now, how do we do that? How do we open ourselves to the inspiration and the guidance of the Holy Spirit? Well, Here's some ideas how you might be able to jumpstart your, your Bible reading. Don't begin at the beginning, ironically. You might be tempted to just go right to chapter 1 of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, and the beginning of God's creating. Now the problem is they, they do make good reading. They do have some wonderful stories in there. But don't sweat over the stories, whether they're true or not. Look instead for what God is revealing in the story. Yes, stories like Adam and Eve in the garden, the Tower of Babel, Noah in the ark, the lives of the patriarchs of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Leah. Right after that comes the thrilling stories known as the Joseph cycle. Joseph and his coat of many colors, or more accurately, probably the coat with long sleeves. Sold into slavery, given up for dead, becoming in charge of Pharaoh's household, and deciding to use his powers for grace and forgiveness rather than, his, rather than revenge when he encounters his brothers. Don't worry about if it's historical or not. Look at what God is revealing in these stories. 
it's, if you're looking for a place to begin maybe daily Bible reading, start with, some would say, the Gospel of Mark. It shares the essential message of Jesus' life and death and resurrection in an elegantly simple fashion. Better to start there than, say, the Gospel of John. Now, the Gospel of John is laden with some pretty heavy theology served up in long discourses and tedious and repetitious. Some have likened the Gospel of John also to walking into the middle of a family fight because some feel that this is where Jesus caught, where the church is beginning to distinguish itself between those that were Hebrew who followed Jesus versus those that were non-Hebrew, say the Gentiles that began to follow Jesus and may not have been familiar with all this background. And if you're not familiar with it, you're going to find it harder to understand and find yourself getting frustrated. Don't, also, don't forget that the, the Bible is actually more of a library than a single book. It's not a single book, it's a library. It's written over periods of hundreds of years by many authors and many types of of writings are in it. Some are history, some are poetry, some philosophy, some are letters sent by the apostles like Paul to various churches. Some are (coughs) what we call apocalyptic. They're revealing something hidden. Yes, because these are books are gathered together and encased in, in an elegant leather cover, doesn't mean that it's one book. So it's easier to say the books of the Bible. It, it helps you to understand why the Bible can have such a range of encounters. Even the Gospels themselves are are like watching a traffic accident from four different corners. Yes. Understand what's truly holy. Many times, of course, the Bible has the word holy in front of it, usually stamped in gold letters. But what does that mean? Yes, the Bible is like any other, is like, is unlike any book. But at the same time, it was not meant to be carried about or revered itself. If you don't read it, you're not getting it. If you're not reading the Bible, then it's not revealing itself. Bibles were not meant to be adored. They were meant to be read and reread and and bookmarked and underlined. And whenever you need to get deeply into that message, that can be a problem when Bibles are simply waved around more than they're being read. Don't use your Bible for clobbering. One of the dangers of digging into the Bible to prove something that you've already got in your mind, to prove something, you might actually be using the Bible for a purpose that it was never intended for. In fact, when you do that, you're not studying the Bible, you're proof texting. Finding a verse or part of a verse to to prove a point that you, O mortal one, are trying to make is not reading the Bible, it's using the Bible. To push a policy, to score a point, to condemn someone that you disagree with or don't understand, then you've weaponized your Bible in a way that it was never meant to. (coughs) take your time silent meditation and prayer are critical when reading the bible don't bite off huge chunks of the scriptures focus instead maybe on smaller manageable pieces a paragraph or two might be right Pray for the guidance of the Spirit when you read the passage. Pause for reflection. Read it again. Pause again. Empty your mind of any stray thoughts. And then maybe read it a third time, concentrating on insights that you might have picked up. Think of yourself as being in conversation with the Lord as you read. Lord, what do you want me to know from what I'm reading? You may help that it, it, you may find that it helps to maybe keep a journal. Keep a journal to write down close at hand some things you've uncovered or some questions that you've had. And you'll find it meaningful to go back later through your notes. 
Be ready for the bigger picture. Keep in mind, again, you're reading a library of books that we call the Bible. It's been on a long journey through time, through cultures, through languages and translations. It's from a time that we would find strange, but also sometimes familiar in other ways. It's revealing the mind of God, which is unfathomable, but doing it by sharing stories from a time and a place that you can relate to. If you spend too much time trying to figure out if or how a story might literally be true, you're missing the point, and you're robbing the Bible of its power to transform and to teach and to reveal what God has in mind. Finally, read it together. Some of the most helpful things you can do is read the Bible with others, a close friend or family member, someone you can trust, maybe a group at church. The insights that raise from several different people who might see things differently. Each one brings their own unique perspectives, and it can truly be enriching, as with anything in life. Having someone else to keep us accountable is not a bad thing. But far more important than getting any methodology right is to set aside that time and do it. Too many times I've gone into homes and found the Bible sitting there on the shelf covered with dust. Sometimes even maybe propped up as a prop. But that's not how it was meant to be enjoyed. That's not how it's going to nourish you. Yes, it's kind of like bread. If you kept bread simply sitting on the shelf, it would go stale. But... It's meant to be eaten. And so the Bible is meant to be consumed, to take and open its pages, to to read what it has for you. Turn off your phone, open your Bible. Yes, there used to be a sportswear company that used to have the, the logo, it was just do it. When it comes to the Bible, maybe the best motto is just read it. You won't get anything from it if you don't. We thank you for your support, for your gifts of time and treasure and energy and talent. And now, gracious God, you've blessed us with all that we need and often more than what we need. Help us to receive what you give with grace and in turn help us to be generous with our gifts, our possessions, our time and our treasure and our talent. We ask that you would accept them, consecrate what we bring to further your work. Amen. Please join us in worship as we sing Cornerstone. Oh
trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless I stand before the throne. Faultless I stand before the throne. Please join us in singing Days of Rebecca. Take both our concerns and our joys and take them to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. God of infinite love and grace, we come to you ever thankful for this time of worship and fellowship. We offer our thanks for friends and family wherever we are gathered and ask that your healing presence be with those who are ill with those that are homebound, with those who mourn or sorrow, or who struggle too deep for words. We acknowledge that sometimes our faith blinds us to each other and to that which is holy. Yet we confess there are some times that people may not feel bound together. They might feel the walls pressing in on them instead. Sometimes we we don't fully hear those in pain around us. And sometimes when we do listen, we listen poorly. We talk when we should be silent. We become mute when we should use our voices. Help us. Help us to break down the walls of apathy and reluctance. 
so that we would do what God has us to do. We thank you for those around us. Help us to catch a vision. Open our hearts to the strengthening presence. And as we come to you, we draw strength from the words that Jesus taught us as we say together, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, wherever you are, may the light always shine in your darkness. May your ears always hear the word. May grace rain down upon you. And may the glory of the Father's only Son be known to you now and forever. Amen. Please join us as we sing One Pair of Hands, followed by Jesus. Every bird, every flower, every tree.